This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of February 27th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain how permanent fund earnings are being shifted from middle and lower income Alaska families to the top 20% and why the amount is already staggering and growing. Second, we discuss how Representative Zach Fields is proposing to shift even more. And third, we explain how some producers in the Cook Inlet are coming for even more state money. And now, let's join Michael. Well, let's start off with this, Brad. I really want to get into this because uh, I got some things to say, but I I want to hear what you have to say. So first things first, I mean, it's just, I get, it's, I'll, I'll get first crack and then you you'll get first crack. I'll get, I'll get second crack. So we're looking at the, the, the dollars being shifted from the middle and lower income Alaska families to the top 20% is pretty amazing. And you actually sat down and did the math and got the numbers cranking. And you took a look at it in your latest piece at the, on the Alaska landmine, uh, which is your chart of the week from Friday. And it talks about basically the death of the PFD. How long will it be before the PFD is pretty much gone. Uh, and it's not too long. That's the bottom line. It's not too long. I got a lot of questions after I, after the chart of the week, a couple of weeks ago, uh, was looking at various fiscal baselines. I got a number of questions about, well, how long is it that the PFD lasts on the trajectory we're on? So I, I did last Friday's chart. I focused last Friday's chart on that subject and it's not very long. I, it, by 19, by 19, by 2032, uh, which will be the 50th anniversary of the PFD, the handwriting's pretty much on the wall. It's not gone yet, but there's not much of it left. Uh, if you look at it as a percent of the POMV draw, which is a good way to look at it, uh, by 2032, the PFD, and, you're, and, and I calculate this by taking, uh, filling the deficits that we see ahead, uh, the, the fiscal deficits that we see ahead, filling those with PFD cuts, by 2032, the PFD is down to 10 percent uh, of the uh, of the POMV draw, and the trajectory is just taking it on down. So, by the mid 2030s, shortly after its 50th anniversary, the PFD is essentially a token amount, sort of like the the equivalent of the statutory budget reserve or the or the constitutional budget reserve. It's just we sort of keep it around to say we have it, uh, but it's not much. But the the permanent fund earnings over that period are are growing. Um, uh, throughout the entire period. I mean, the POMB draw just keeps going up and up and up. So what's happening as the PFD comes down and the POMB draw is, is going up, what's happening is we're shifting dollars that, that, are, that are under the PFD being distributed to uh, Alaska families, predominantly a benefit to middle and lower income Alaska families as a percent, as a share of income. We're shifting dollars from that to the other, the other use of the PFD. Now we, we talk about the other use of the, uh, or uh, the other use of permanent fund earnings. We talk about the other use of permanent fund earnings to be to pay for government, but looked differently, looked at differently, what they're, what those, what those permanent fund earnings are really doing is they're subsidizing taxes or replacing taxes or substituting for taxes. If there wasn't permanent fund earnings, then we would be having taxes to pay for those deficits to cut to, to cover the deficit. So the permanent fund earnings that that are going to government are really going 
to prevent or to substitute or to or to cover uh, for taxes, which is predominantly a benefit to the top 20 percent. So what you see over the course of the next decade, and, and we're roughly at 50-50 now. The, the POMV draw is like 46-54, 46, 46 for the PFD, 54 to, to, to substitute for taxes. What you see over the next decade is a rapid shift in the, um, uh, in the permanent fund earnings from being used to in, in, in half to pay for the PFD that declining from roughly 50% down to 10% and the portion being, and, and thus the benefit to middle and income, low, middle and lower income Alaska families declining from roughly 50% down to 10%, shifting over to uh, uh, the benefit to the top 20% being used as a substitute for taxes. And that's going over the next decade from roughly 50% now up to 90% uh, of the draw. The, that's because the, 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 the deficits are growing over that period. Traditional revenues are down. Spending continues to grow. Um, but it's being shifted over. The, the dollars are being taken out of middle and lower income Alaska families, and they're transferring to the benefit of the top 20%. Think for a second what's going on with the top 20%. They would otherwise have to pay taxes to cover the deficits uh, during that entire period. But because of the shift in the POMV draw, uh, the permanent fund earnings to their benefit to substitute for taxes. They're not having to pay for taxes. They're able to keep the money that they would otherwise have to pay for taxes in their pockets. Um, they're not having to pay the taxes. They keep it in their bank account. So what's really going on over this period, over the over the next 10 years, is we're shifting, taking money out of the hands, out of the, out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families, and through substituting for taxes, through using those permanent fund earnings to substitute for taxes, we are we are allowing the top 20 percent to keep their money, the same amount of money that's being taken out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families. That money is, is staying in the pockets uh, of the top 20 percent. And, and the numbers are, are, are sort of staggering. Over the past seven years, as we've been using PFD cuts, uh, we, we've shifted about seven billion dollars out of the pockets of, uh, through PFD cuts, we've shifted about $7 billion out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families, largely into the pockets of the, of the top 20% through PFD cuts. Over the next decade, we're gonna shift an additional $17 billion, $18 billion, almost $18 billion out of the pockets of, 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 of of middle and lower income Alaska families into the pockets of the top 20%. So over the entire period, counting the counting the shifts that have occurred today, up to 2032, we're shifting roughly $25 billion, $25 billion out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families, taking that money out of their pockets through PFD cuts and putting that money instead into the pockets of the top 20% by allowing them to uh, avoid taxes, to have continued government spending, uh, and uh, but not having to pay taxes for it, it's a it's a massive amount of of shift in income uh, that's going on between from middle lower middle and lower income Alaska families up to the top twenty percent. Normally, you think about tax policy and fiscal policy being to the the bad part of it being shifting money out of uh, out of the top twenty percent into middle and lower income Alaska families through progressive taxes. But, but in Alaska, we're doing the exact reverse through regressive taxes, the most regressive tax system in the nation, the most regress regressive fiscal policy approach in the nation. We're shifting money out of middle and lower income Alaska families into, into, right. uh, into the top 20%. So well, tw $25 billion, that's a, that's a huge number. Well, I think one of the key factors there that you're talking about as well is that while they are taking more of the POMV draw, again, what's supposed to be a 50-50, when they're taking 90%, you're also, again, talking about the permanent fund itself increasing. So the returns are increasing. So they're getting a larger portion of a larger piece of the pie and Alaskans are left with crumbs in the end. I mean, if we're getting 10%, it might be an $800 dividend. Uh, but what it really should be is like a six or seven thousand dollar dividend. So all that money is going straight to the state. We I did that calculation on, on the side as I was doing last week's charts. I'll 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 print it at some point. But the dividend goes from roughly twenty four hundred dollars. It should be 
we'll talk about this uh, in, in a minute when, when we talk about Zach Fields op-ed. But the dividend this year, just to cover the deficit, is about would be about twenty four hundred dollars the the amount left over um, uh, after after deducting for the deficit twenty four hundred dollars this year down to less than seven hundred dollars by twenty thirty two uh, it's declining over that entire period and the seven hundred dollars I mean that quickly goes on down as um, as you know as additional years go by additional deficits go by as the ten percent shrinks even further. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're talking about the weekly top three. And again, this hits, uh, you know, this hits directly in the middle ground. Um, somebody asked the question, you know, can we get a can we get a valuation on all the uh, uh, all the the things that the lower income people receive, you know, uh, SNAP benefits and all that stuff. Uh, it's, it's not just the lowest in lowest income people that are hit though. It's also the middle class who are getting squeezed on this as well. And, and, you know, people, people, people want to say, oh, snap benefits. That's a, that's a federal benefit. It's not a state benefit. I mean, you're, you're, you're mixing and matching, you're right. mixing it's and matching there. It's administered by the state, but it's a federal benefit. Right. It's federal money. So right. the only, the only really benefit, and it's not really a benefit to lower income Alaska families, the only really benefit that's coming from state dollars that's that's distributed like that that's that's disproportionate uh, to to lower income Alaska families is Medicaid, and and Medicaid is not go, those dollars don't end up in the pockets of lower income Alaska families. Those doc those dollars end up in the healthcare system, end up in the pockets of docs and and hospitals and others in the healthcare system, who largely are, are in the top twenty percent. The greatest opponents. I, I'll never forget this. The greatest pushback that Governor Dunleavy got when he was talking initially about Medicaid cuts was not, or Medicare cuts, whichever it is, was not uh, was not from lower income Alaska families or representative of lower income Alaska families. It was from the docs, the doctors, and the healthcare system who otherwise are 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 you know taking those dollars and pocketing those dollars and 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 have become dependent. On that government, on that government program for for their income. So the one state program we have that people might complain about and say, "Oh well, you know, those are benefits to lower income Alaska families that are that are coming out of out of state coffers." Those really aren't benefits. I mean, they get they get the services, but the dollars aren't going into their pockets. The dollars are going into the pockets of the of the docs and the healthcare system. Yeah. Uh, Brad Keithley continues. Uh, let's go on to number two, Brad, uh, the uh, Zach Fields. If you want to give me a uh, if you want to give me a synopsis, we'll go to break early and come back and have see if we can get two and three in in one segment there. So Zach Fields has an op ed in the, that you mentioned earlier, has an op ed in the ADN uh, that talks about uh, what to be what we ought to be doing uh, in terms of fiscal policy. And his argument is that we ought to cut the PFD. Now, remember that the PFD, the PFD amount after closing the deficit that's projected for this coming fiscal year, the PFD amount is about $2,400. Zach says we ought to be cutting the PFD down to $1,000 and using the surplus, as he calls it, uh, for other state spending programs. And right. we'll talk. We'll talk more about the about the impact of that. But it's, the investing, you plebes, you don't pay taxes anyway. So what do you care? That's the kind of the answer that we're. Oh man, this whole op ed thing is just. I mean, I read it and my brain just immediately melted down after reading it because I'm just like the stretches that we go to here. But I can see it already, Brad. I've been talking about this for a long time that this was going to be the this was going to be the next phase of the attack is that they're going to tell us, well, we don't pay taxes anyway. Now you've got to pay your fair share. Now you've got to do it. They're already starting that, you know, oh, you just, you know, we don't pay any taxes and that's just free money. And, uh, you know, the irony here, of course, is that Zach Fields, his constituency is made up of a bunch of low income people and they should be burning him at the stake over something like this because they're losing ten thousand fifteen thousand dollars out of their households if they've got a couple kids or whatever they're losing a huge amount and he's basically saying well we know better than you how to spend this money yeah zach fields is ron duncan and jim jansen's favorite uh favorite legislator democrat or republican he's just their favorite legislator because because he's leading the charge for continual cuts in the pfd to pay for bigger government but the continual but the continual cuts to, in the pfd also 
are shifting over and benefiting the top 20% by uh, avoiding, by enabling them uh, to avoid uh, taxes. And he just, and, you know, Zach's purpose is to get more money into government to pay for more government employees. We were talking before we were on the show or, 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 or during the show, but we were talking about Zach's latest bill, which is to, which, which is essentially to nationalize or statize uh, the childcare industry by, by subsidizing, by providing for subsidies to creating a fund to subsidize the child care industry, allowing child care providers to collectively bargain uh, with the state for uh, the amount they're going to be paid uh, uh, out of that fund. Just, you know, creating, making child care employees, state employees, essentially. Um, and, you know, and Zach's never met a government program he doesn't like, but he doesn't want to pay for it. He doesn't want to pay for it by having Jim Jansen and Ron Duncan digging into their pockets and paying a proportionate amount of it because he knows if he does it that way, they will oppose the program. The legislature will oppose the program, and so and so the program won't go forward. So what he's doing is he's taking it out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families, instead shifting the benefits to to Ron Duncan and Jim Jansen by enabling them to avoid uh, paying taxes. And so they go, "Yeah, you want another program? I don't care. It's not coming out of my pocket. Uh, go ahead, go at it." I mean, it, we saw the same thing with Natasha von Imhoff. When she was in the state Senate, she, you know, supported additional government programs. Um, at the same time, she supported, P supported PFD cuts because middle and lower income Alaska families, by using PFD cuts, middle and lower income Alaska families paid for those programs as opposed to the top 20 percent. So Zach's just continuing to, 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 you know, to be Jim Jansen and Ron Duncan's favorite legislator by 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 pushing additional government programs. But by doing it in a way where they don't have to, Jansen and Duncan and the others in the top 20% don't have to pay the costs. There's plenty of uh, <clears throat> there's plenty of ways that we could uh, cut the spend in the state of Alaska. Brad and I have analyzed those, broken them down. There's money left on the table for the oil industry. We could be taking another three, four, five hundred million dollars out of that. We could be doing all those things. Unfortunately, as we pointed out, there just doesn't seem to be the political will to take that approach. I mean, any time uh, we've seen that happen, I mean, even and we keep pointing it out, even when the governor redlined a lot of this stuff, that he couldn't get 16 Republicans in the legislature to support his redlining of that kind of stuff as well. So, I mean, we, we, we've, we've got to take a grip on this and figure out how do we slow roll everything that's happening? Because it seems like right now, the majority of players in the legislature now, granted, we've got a whole new batch now this year, but the, in the past, the whole majority of the legislature has been on the path to just creating bigger, badder government programs. We can't figure out how to get them to cut or even to acknowledge that cuts are needed. I mean, the fiscal policy working group did as part of their thing, but it wasn't all cuts. It was a combination of everything. And that's the problem. We can't get to the cuts only approach from here. Until, until you get Jim Jansen and Ron Duncan and others in the top 20% focused on cuts, until you get them focused on cuts, that's the donor class, that's the that's the trade trade group class, that's the class that hires the lobbyists, until you get them focused on cuts, we're not going to have cuts. We're going to have a lot of talk about it, but we're not going to have we're not going to have cuts made. And the only way you're going to get them focused on it is if they have to pay a share of the costs of government. Right now, they don't have to. Using PFD cuts, they avoid paying for uh, the cost of government. So, you know, we can talk about this. We can talk about the, the, the theory of cuts all day long, as you said. We have for the last decade. But until you have the political will of the top 20%, not just, not just general political will, but the political will of the top 20% of the donor class, of the, of the lobbying class, of the, the trade association, the trade association class, until you have their political will involved in, in making cuts, they're not going to happen. Welcome back to the program. The weekly top three continues. Brad Keithley, our guest, Zach Fields, wrote a piece. Uh, I think it's the first shot in a bigger battle, a more longer term battle. And I think it shows the ultimate end game of what some of the legislators there in Juneau want to see, which, of course, is a s basically subsumption of the PFD into government spending. And they'll throw us a few crumbs at the end. But basically, the whole article entails, we know better than you how to spend your money, so you should just shut up and sit down and let us do it. 
Brad, your thoughts on Zach Fields piece and the breakdown. Well, it's just, it's, it's basically, it, it, it's, it's, as, as I was saying during the break, it's Ron, he's Ron Dan Duncan and Jim Jansen's favorite legislator because Zach Fields wants to grow bigger government. Um, he wants to, he wants to uh, uh, expand government services. His child care bill, bill is, is one example of that, but he doesn't want, he, he, he doesn't want to trigger the opposition of the top 20%. So he's proposing to do it through PFD cuts. Uh, taking it out of the hides of middle and lower income Alaska families uh, while he while he's growing government and he and he's you know he's he's setting a target out there of saying well we really only need a thousand dollar thousand dollar PFD that's really sort of the average it's not but it's really sort of the average over the entire program and so you know you ought to be happy with a thousand dollar PFD and we'll just take all of the additional money above that and we'll put it into bigger government programs and what you've got is the top twenty percent saying yeah I'm fine. Because they don't have to pay for it. I mean, Zields, Fields is being very smart about how he's approaching this. He's approaching it in a way that allows him to grow government, but doesn't trigger the lobbyists, the trade associations, the 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 the, the, the big donor class uh, involved in the state. He's he's able he's he's doing it in a way that's 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 trying to uh, trying to end run those. Jim Jansen will write an editorial on occasion. That will talk about, yeah, we really need to we need to avoid taxes, so we need to keep using PFD cuts. Uh, and Fields every time on Twitter and on Facebook will say, yeah, this is a, exactly the right approach. This is exactly what what I've been saying all along. It's like this mutual support group between the the big government left and the and the anti tax right. As long as you don't tax me, as long as Ron Duncan and, and Jim Jensen, as long as you don't tax me then whatever you do is fine. The only way we're ever going to get this stopped is to, is to make Ron Duncan, Jim, the Ron Duncans and the Jim Jansons and the top 20% pay their fair share, their proportionate share of, of the cost of government. As long as we don't do that, we're going to continue to have things like, uh, like Zach Fields. And I know, I know people say, well, you know, when we get to taxes, we'll finally stop it. We'll, we'll finally stop. We'll finally stop spending. A, I'm not sure that's right. I think, you know, given what we've seen, all we'll do is we'll shift into the, the next most regressive tax approach, which is sales taxes, continue to take it out of middle and lower income Alaska families. But B, if we wait until we get there before we make the top 20% pay their fair share, if we wait until we get there, the PFD will be gone. Middle and lower income Alaska families permanent will, permanently will, be, will be, have, have suffered uh, uh, the, the loss of income that would occur from from PFD payments, the top 20% will have converted all of the permanent fund earnings stream to their benefit to cover for taxes. So we've got it. We, we've got us to be stopping it now. We can't wait until we get down to the, down to the, oh, well, now we're going to have to go to, now we're going to have to go to taxes situation. Uh, Kevin says, funny that a union hack is pandering to the captains of industry. Isn't that a little strange? Not in Alaska. That's business as usual. That's corporate cronyism. That's what we're seeing right now. Uh, I mean, is a, a total uh, fee of corporate cronyism where they want the government spending, they need the government spending, and the unions, they love to cozy right up to that because they could see more of that money coming into their pockets through more state employees. Exactly. It's, 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 it's the path of least resistance. I mean, the, 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 the people that really control the legislature is the donor class, the lobbyist class, the trade association class. They're really the ones that, that, that are able to press the buttons that control the legislature. If you don't trigger them, then you're going you're gonna to be able to, to, to you're going to have a much easier path in adopting the program. And that's exactly what Fields is doing. I mean, he wants bigger government. He wants more government, more, more government employees. That's his job as a union organizer to go out and get more government employees. He wants more government employees. So he's so he's growing government to have more government employees to have more to have more union members uh, members of of his union and he's doing it in a way that doesn't trigger pushback from the lobbyist class from the top twenty from the donor class and from and from the trade groups it, it's I mean tactically it's brilliant uh, in terms of in terms of figuring out a way to get what you want without without triggering the opposition the only problem is. 80% of Alaska families are ending up worse off. The overall Alaska economy ends up worse off because of that approach. And, right. and 
and and and and that's the direction we're going. Zach Fields gets what he got, what he wants. Ron Duncan and 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 Jim Jansen get what they want. It's just eighty percent of Alaska families are being left out, left out in the cold on this. I love how he goes into the kind of the uh, you know professorial history mode here. You know, while payments of PFTs based on the nineteen eighty two formula is no longer practical, we can afford PFTs roughly in line with the original legislative intent of roughly a thousand dollars, which is similar to the historic average of dividends over the last four decades. That was when you talk about legislative intent. You could go back and see the legislative intent was that the PFD had the first call on all that money, first of all. And it wasn't, it had no dollar figure attached. It was a 50, 50 I mean, it was the, your share of the money. Just because the overall pot has gotten bigger and now your share looks nice and juicy to those legislators, now all of a sudden they're like, well, the legislative intent was right. Well, yeah, the legislative intent was it should have first call. It was a transfer. It was not a income and outgo. It was a transfer if you want to talk about intent. I love how they're trying to twist this to their advantage. Well, and Hammond, Hammond always talked about percentages, right, as a, per, as a percent of the permanent fund earnings going to – Alaska families and talked about as the as the permanent fund grew and as the earnings grew on the permanent fund, a higher, higher and higher amount would go to Alaska families to to, you know, as their share of of the state's commonly owned wealth. He never talked about an absolute amount. The absolute amount at the time was roughly in that in that range. But Hammond never talked about an absolute amount. He always talked about about percentages and Alaska families always getting a, a a percent sh- percentage share of the benefits of the of the commonly owned wealth. So yeah, it's I mean, but Zach Fields isn't alone. I remember when the PFD issue first started in the late in the late twenty teens. I had this debate with with uh, 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 Kevin Myers of all people, Republican Kevin Myers. You know, staunch staunch Republican Kevin Myers, and Kevin Myers gave me that that song and dance about right. how the average PFD over time is about you know twelve hundred dollars or fifteen hundred dollars or you know whatever the hell they wanted to make it up to be at the time. If you take out inflation, you can make it almost any number. Or if you use different inflation rates, you can make it almost any number you want. And how and how you know that was the average PFD. And aren't we lucky that we're gonna that, that we're able to continue to do that? No, Kevin, we're not we're not lucky that right. we're able to continue to do that. Yeah, exactly. It's not your money. That's the whole point. Is that it's not your money, although you are taking it and you have continued to take it. Uh, one of the things that we were talking about before the break was the advance of the uh, of the spending cap that's coming out of the house, going to Ways and Means now. And of course, Cliff Grow was quoted as he always is uh, about uh, you know, oh well, the fiscal policy working group said it had to be this holistic approach, and this is just one piece. That's not going to work. But I don't see Cliff Grow advancing oil taxes or new revenues or cuts or any of the other things that that are talked about in there it's just it's more whack 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 instead of actually working to fix the problem yeah, yeah. The, i mean we, we saw it before in sb what 23 is that is that was that the pomv statute yep you get a partial solution i mean cliff's right in this respect you get a partial solution people lock in on that and say well we solved the problem we don't have to worry about it anymore and, and they forget the other pieces of it. So Cliff's right that it has to be a holistic approach. But you're right in that it, in that it ha- and then people have to actually come up with the other pieces of it. And for Cliff to complain about one piece of it without offering the other piece of it is uh, pieces of it is somewhat disingenuous. The real pre- in, to me, the real the real key, the real pressure in this legislature is on Ben Carpenter and on the Ways and Means Committee. They're supposed to come up with the holistic approach. And, 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 you know, my eyes are on them. I hope other people's eyes are on them looking to them to come up with a holistic approach. They're getting the, the, uh, the, 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 the spending cap bill next after it passed out of house judiciary, it's going to go to ways and means. And, and I hope that they consider it and hold it as they build the other component pieces of the overall fiscal plan and then advance them all together. If they just if they just let that spending cap go on through without putting the other pieces together with it at the same time, it's just going to be like SB 23. It's just going to be, you know, another another partial solution that people are going to say, well, we finally did it. We finally got a fiscal plan. We don't have to do anything more for the next seven years or 10 years or 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 whatever. Let's make it the holistic approach And the place to make it. The holistic approach is the place where it's supposed to be occurring in uh, in House Ways and Means. 
Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Donna says, be careful what you ask for. Yeah, I mean, 